Hello, I'm Zan Perion, and I just got finished speaking here at the 21 convention in Miami, Florida. You're about to watch a, an, an episode of the video series that I created uh, called In Search of the Alabaster Girl. And it's about a book I wrote called The Alabaster Girl, and the video series is, a, is an in-depth commentary and a roundtable discussion about the themes and the concepts of the book. So I hope you enjoy what you're about to watch. Okay, let's begin. First of all, I want to say I'm absolutely thrilled that you guys are here to join me in this little uh, project, this uh, um, experiment, coffee conversation around the book, The Alabaster Girl, uh, kind of a running commentary like behind the, the DVD movie. It's a behind the scenes commentary about why and, and what and, and a deeper exploration of the themes here. And I can't think of a better group of guys to share this with. I've got Rich here. Jordan, Owen all the way from Australia, and I'm very happy to begin this conversation and, and it's gonna be long and it's gonna be deep. So let's start right at the very beginning. Uh, why did you write this book, your book, The Alabaster Girl? <sighs> okay, well, I've been thinking about, I've been wanting to write a book about my knowledge or my, my learnings with women for many years. I've been wanting to capture some of the moments and capture some of the things I've tried to understand. And as you guys know, I've done a lot of public speaking. I've done a lot of, you know, coaching and seminars and stuff I had around that. But the book really is the whole, the whole knowledge or the whole culmination of everything I've, I've known in all my years to this point. And um, so I've been wanting to write this book for <laughs> probably over 20 years. And I've been thinking about it for a long time. And there's pieces in this book that were written um, more than 10 years ago. There's some like pieces that were written more than 10 years ago. So there's a long, drawn-out process. And it's, it's something I wanted to say that I, I wish that I would have had when I was young. When I was 19, 20, mm -hmm. trying to figure things out. And I was insecure and trying to you know, be interesting and be cool. And I had no answers. And so this is kind of my legacy back to myself, I guess you could say. Well, I've been wondering who the book was for, because uh, I've heard you say that before, but it also seems like large parts of the book are written to a woman. Yeah. And also you mentioned that actually these are memories that you want to keep yourself when you're an old yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like what Casanova did when he got old, he wrote down his memories and mm -hmm. so he could relive them. And it's kind of, I understand that a bit. Um, yeah, I started to write this book as a kind of a how-to, I guess you could say, or a, an instruction-y type book. You know, like you see them, the general way that books are written today in this genre, which is, okay, guys, here's something I've learned, and you could incorporate this, and here's three steps to X, Y, Z, and but it didn't feel right, and I could have put this book out mm, five years ago. I mean, it took me ten years to write it. I could put it out five years ago. Mm -hmm. But then it wouldn't have been an honest book. It would have been a cool book. You guys would say, hey, I like that book from San Perry. I learned this, and I learned this. It would have mm -hmm. good information in it. But it had to have some kind of vulnerability in it, mm -hmm. deeper questions, deeper exploration, to be authentic, I guess, or to, be, to make it a real, I don't know, to make it real. and, and Make it, it a real reflection of the man that you, you've become. Yes, and not, and not make... It, not to be cool. I could write a book that makes me look cool. 
and it says all the cool things and all the right answers and all that. But there's more, in, in my mind, there's more mystery in this book and more questions in this book than there are answers. That's how I see it. So, so you, you said you've ended up with a book that has three different parts. Yeah. And it seems like some of it is instructional. Okay, in, let me, in a way. Let me talk mm. about that, the flow of this book. I said it took me 10 years to write it. And it wasn't because I was blocked or I didn't know what to put next or I mm. needed a... I, I had volumes of things in my mind that I could put down on paper. In fact, I would say, you know, I, now I think about it, I would say that 80% of this book was written five years ago. Wow. Mm. In fact, I went, maybe you guys already know this, but I went four years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, I went to Nicaragua. I was traveling, I was doing talks, I was doing this kind of stuff, and I was working on the book, but not really concentrating on it. And you know that, that, that well, I have this thought all the time, or not all the time, that, man, if you ever got stuck in prison for six months or got on a deserted island, you could sure get a lot done, like writing, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, how can I artificially create this for myself? So I took off. I had this travel schedule. Um, I was doing the seminars like that, and I took off to Nicaragua just to work on the book, just to fight for something, just to say, okay, it's 80% done. Let's go sit somewhere where it's quiet, uh, where there's no distractions, and, um, and, and fight for the finishing of this book. And four, four and a half years ago when I went to Nicaragua, I thought, I'm here for three or four months. There's, there's no reason I can't finish it. I'm going to finish it. My goal is to finish the mm. book then. Four years later, <laughs> I finally finished it. And, I, and, and Nicaragua was interesting because I had no distractions there. No one spoke English. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a small fishing village on, uh, you know, on, on the surf, on the ocean. Um, I had a, the woman next door would bring me a fish every day. I sat in the same t-shirt and shorts every day and just sat there. No, no real electricity. In fact, no electricity. And so at 8 o'clock when it gets dark, you just go to bed because there's nothing else to do. And you get up when the, when the chickens are clucking and crowing and stuff. And I would sit down at the book with my writing implements at the desk and I'd say, okay, I'm going to start. Full day ahead. Nothing to do. No to-do list, no internet, no Facebook, no Perfect. that thing. Yeah. Right? And so here I am. And I would sit down there and I would look at stuff I'd, lo I'd looked at yesterday and I'd change a word, change it back change a phrase, look at it like this, write a couple sentences, do another paragraph, think, you know, maybe that thing I wrote earlier should be here and I go find that, try and find that and try and stick it here. An hour would go by of me just picking away mm -hmm. and then I would say, you know what? I, I really need to think about this a bit and I'd go for a walk. Mm -hmm. I'd walk along the beach and the surf and the big surf crashing and stuff like that and I would walk along thinking, and then I'd come back and I'd look at it again for a little bit. And I think, you know, maybe I'm just tired. I need a nap. <laughs> so I'd lay in a hammock and, you know, just lay and read one of the books I found laying around there and, and lay in the hammock for a while and take a nap. And then I'd get, eat the fish the, the, the lovely uh, woman brought over with the beans and the, and the rice. And then uh, look at the book again. And then it get dark. And I'm not kidding when I say that I was not productive at all. Wow. on my de deserted island, on my prison sentence. Yet you worked every day. Yet I looked at it every day. But more I wandered. Mm. More I wandered and, and, and looked at this. And I learned Spanish and, you know, from, from, the, from, the, from the people there. They were lovely people. I looked at the surf. I stared at it. I, I, I laid on my, in my bed and I looked up at the geckos eating the, the moss. Just watched that and spoke a little Spanish. And, and what I... And I thought, why can I, am I not productive? In, in my normal world, mm. I distract myself. Because yeah. I'm going to take a shower, and i got to get on Facebook, and, and Owen wants to go for a coffee, you know. Mm. So there's a million distractions. But I, ha I didn't have any distractions there. And I, sit, and I said to myself, why am I not productive? And I was beating myself up. How mm. come I can't finish this book there with no distractions? I'm inventing distractions. Mm. And I did only realized recently, all these years <clears throat> later, that... And I when I was talking to somebody, at Nicaragua, that sojourn there, that disappearance into the wilderness for me, my 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, mm. was not, even though I thought it was, was not a time to finish the book. It was a time to reflect on the deeper questions of the book. Mm. And it's informed throughout. The Nicaraguan experience and the things I thought about then are informed in here. Mm. So it created a, a, sometime a, a depth to it that I didn't have before. 
Mm-hmm. So, so I, that was the real purpose of it. And I, and, and I sat in questions and I sat in confusion the whole time in Nicaragua and, and lay in the hammock and thinking, how come I can't get this going? I can't get it. But it was a necessary part of it. And, it's what, and, and, you know, and when I came away from there, from that culture shock to Amsterdam, I went straight from four months of like sitting and sweating, you know, bugs crawling mm-hmm. around to Amsterdam and I did a major seminar. And with, you know, 20 guys, we did weekend intensive. So I really boom and boom. And my whole message changed because of Nicaragua. Yeah. It, it came to the, you know. That's what I'm wondering, because it's a bit off the topic of the book. <clears throat> how were you different in your seminar after four and a half months in Nicaragua? It's where I, it's where I, I, I came up in Nicaragua and put in my head this phrase, which I've been saying ever since, which is, every great life has had in it a great renunciation. That, that, that arose from my thinking and, and, and anguish in Nicaragua. So, so, I mean, like, the book was hard for me to write. It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm. And, to, and I have a lot of respect for people who are writers and can construct a book from beginning to end because it's the forest for the trees. You can't see, like, I'm looking at this paragraph here and I'm thinking, well, there's another paragraph I wrote that really should go next year, and I can't, mm. you know, and I'm, sometimes I was working on a little iPad and what is my travels, you know, I'm like trying to scroll and find these pieces and yeah, it was a hard thing to do. Structurally, content was not so hard, mm. but structurally and the flow, and, and to go back to your question, Jordan, I originally started to write this as a book to my younger self, I guess you could say, to men. Mm. It was like a say, you know what, this is what I've learned. <clears throat> and I toyed with all kinds of concepts like, um, the, the conversation in the book, which ended up being between a man and a woman, could be between an older man and a younger man. And, and all the things I've learned, I'm 80 now and I'll teach. But the problem is that 80-year-old man came to his dating life at a different era. That doesn't apply to the, guy, the young guy with Tinder and Facebook and everything all flowing around now. It doesn't work. So his advice is, oh, go to church and meet your woman. And, you know, it's simple, sonny, right? <laughs> But it isn't simple, and it's a complex these days. Much more complex than we've ever had in history, I would say. There's too many options, just like there's too many breakfast cereal options, yeah. mm-hmm. right? So, so, so I wrestled with, you know, I didn't want to write a, a how-to book or a self-help book. So I wanted to write a kind of a, a metaphor, I guess you, you could say, and I, and I did. And it ended up that I realized I could write something uh, more authentic if I'm saying it to women. I wrote a book about women to women. <laughs> that's presumptuous. <laughs> but that's what I attempted to do. And so, um, and so it ended up being, and I'll, I'll say this, because I, and I also abstracted it for myself. I removed it one step removed from myself because it's the guy on the train. And people say, well, you said in the book, uh, this is a, hey, this is a novel. And this is like yeah. the guy on the train said that. <laughs> Gives me a little bit of a like a plausible one. So um, I don't know why it had to be that because it, it couldn't be just Zan Perian speaking to women. Yeah, that felt that didn't ring ring true in some way. Yeah. It had to have this kind of a a journey spirit to it. Mm-hmm. And as you guys know, it ended up being a journey on a train. Why a train? Where does a train go? It's like why is it an interview on a train as opposed to in a coffee shop? Mm-hmm. I don't know. It just had to be that way, and it just it evolved that way. And the train also is a captive audience for him. If he's sitting down for a two-hour interview at a, you know, a, a table like this, let's do the interview. But he's stuck on the train with a woman mm. sitting across him. He can't escape. And he says, you know what? So then he really has to explore. He doesn't have to. He can still say, which he does at the beginning, I get, do your interview. I got, I got good answers. Let's go. I've been here before. Mm-hmm. And she said, I don't want that. I want to know the real what you've never said before, what really is behind your thought process, what is the good and the bad behind there? And he's never said that before, and he says, you know, all these years, I have the answers, I have the pat answers. So what is it that I haven't said? Mm-hmm. And so, so his <coughs> whole, whole thing is like, since I'm stuck with you on the train and you see, seem sincere, mm-hmm. and I've never said it before, I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna tell you everything, everything I know about women that I've never really said. And then it becomes, that becomes the rest of the book. So the, the, you know, the chapters start with this dialogue of the man and woman on a train. He's being interviewed because he wrote a book. This is the, 
inception layer type thing. Yeah. He wrote a book called The Alabaster Girl, which is the book within the book, which is a fake book. And, and uh, so he basically says, uh, so, so the first thing is the interview with them. And he says, you really want to know the whole truth? I'm going to brain dump. And it becomes this kind of like the monologue where he's like mm-hmm. talking to women in general. It expands mm-hmm. to the audience of women. And interspersed through his monologue is pieces of the fictional book he wrote, which is the very poetic love story that he's had with women that he injects, it's injected through the pages. So there's actually three different styles of writing here. The, 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 the train conversation is very, you know, kind of rat-a-tat-tat. Yeah. You're right? It's like normal people would talk. Yeah. And then the monologue gets more into this, let me understand, and, and he gets a bit more florid and a bit more um, ornamental, I guess you could say. Mm. And then his remembrances are stream of consciousness mm-hmm. and, and, and impressionist paintings of women that he's known. And, and, and it's a fleeting image of, of this woman as opposed to, hey, I met Rebecca uh, on the corner of, you know, Fifth and Vine. Yeah. And uh, we went for a coffee and, uh, you know, it, he wanted to write about the feeling of it as an impressionist mm-hmm. painter would write about the feeling of the bridge as opposed to just painting the bridge. Is there one of those three layers that is closest to your heart? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. The alabaster pieces, the fictional pieces, the, the essays that are the impressions ones, yeah. were the easiest ones for me to write. Yeah. yeah. Those are one take. I'm not kidding. Like, I, like, those are one pass through. And the conversational training was the hardest. Mm. I changed that for, for years. That doesn't, she, no one talk like that. She wouldn't say that logically. And I didn't want it to be like a, it was hard. The conversation mm. on the train was the hardest thing for me to write. I rewrote that, rewrote it, rewrote it, rewrote it. The Alabaster pieces, I'll tell you a little story. I, I made a commitment to publish this on December 14, my birthday, my 50th birthday. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to publish that book. It's been 10 years since my 40th when I started it. <laughs> I'm going to publish it on my birthday. So I gave myself for the first time a deadline. And... Um, and on December 12th, I was in Bucharest, going to go to, my, to Vancouver to visit my family for my birthday and for the publishing of this book, the release mm-hmm. of this book. And on the plane from, from Bucharest to Warsaw, and the layover, and the, and the nine-hour flight from Warsaw to Toronto, or, you know, or, or to Vancouver, mm-hmm. I can't remember how exactly it was, I wrote an Alabaster piece, which is the one about Brazil. Yeah. Mm-hmm. With one take, without no editing, no one looked at it ever. And I just slid it into the book the day before I published it. And it's my favorite piece. It's mm-hmm. the one I didn't review and didn't talk Perfect. about yeah. and didn't agonize and change. Maybe this word's not, I couldn't, I had no time to replace yeah. the words. And it's my favorite piece. Wow. Mm. So I'm wondering, um, you live 40 years of life. Yeah exploration into women, exploration of life, and you spend 10 years writing a book about that. What's it like to turn 50 and have that massive project closed and complete? I always said, you know, when I finish this, (laughs) years I'm writing this book, I said, when I finish this book, I've been traveling on a a little iPad or a little netbook. I've always been a a gamer and a computer. I always been like, I said, when I finish this book, I'm going to go sit somewhere for three months buy a screaming game machine with a video card and a sound card and sit there and then play video games for three months because I haven't done it in a long time to celebrate. Mm. But what was interesting when I finished this and the day I published it, and, and, and it, it, it was very strange to me, I had no sense of, of celebration at all. Like, you know, you score the winning goal and you win the Stanley Cup or, the, mm-hmm. you know, and you're like, ah, that kind yeah. of feeling. Yeah. And I talked to Christopher, our friend Christopher, yeah. who just, he, he'd been trying to do his, his music album for years. And, and he had the same thing. When he finally finished his album, he said like, okay, that's done. What's the next project? Mm-hmm. And it's the kind of the same thing people that climb Everest. They get up there and they're up there for two minutes. They're like, what's next? After what's eight next? years of preparation, they're like, okay. Well, I remember talking with you because we lived together for a little while as you were starting to put things into structure. And... Uh, we were talking about this whole idea of men who build yachts in their yard 
So, oh, you, yeah. so you, you can get plans off the internet and all the different yeah. pieces to make up a sailboat and take it on this dream trip of a lifetime around the world and be like the independent man who constructs it from start to finish. I found on the internet that most people that start that construction project never actually finish it. There's mm -hmm. a sense of attachment to the journey itself and the boat remains three quarters done in the yard. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And where they finish the boat and then they, they have a heart attack and die. Yeah, because right. it, it's just so... That was uh, their purpose. The, the, the heart's been taken yeah. out, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, know, I know a guy exactly that. He built this boat. He's gonna, he had this plan to take it down to Costa Rica and stuff like that, building it in, I think it was Vancouver. And when he finished it, he died. By hand, mm. you know. So you didn't true. die. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> die. <laughs> but, but I also had no sense of, like, intellectually, and... You know, in, in, on that level, I knew that I had accomplished what I set out to do. Mm. So I didn't have any bad feeling about it. And I had a great feeling that it was out there and I got great responses from people. And, and those landed, like strong compliments, like this really changed my life so that. It landed with me, but it never got a sense of, hey, I did something cool for these. Mm. Yeah, I don't know, strange. A strange sense <laughs> that I didn't go, yeah, I did it. Even though I have a feeling, yes, it, I can't describe it. It was really strange. It's strange that I, that I have it here, but I'd never felt it here that I that I that I accomplished that. It's just kind of like it's because I got kind of tired of it. It's like mm. the castle said, "You never finish a painting; you walk away." Right? Mm. And I could have keep editing this forever, Oops. and writing and adjusting and 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 honestly, guys, that was a year ago I, I published this book. I haven't looked at it since, except for today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I have not looked at this book at all. I. I they want me to do an audio book. Like people write me and say, I have an audio yeah. book in your voice. I'm like, I can't read that book again. Like yeah. I, I want to change this and this and this. And I can't. They said that. Yeah. It's so, hard for you to do an audio so, book. So you were working harder and harder and harder right until that final date where you sent it off and snuck the, the Brazil piece in at last mm -hmm. minute. Yeah. Um, before we dive into the contents of the book a bit more deeply, is there anything now when you look back on it that you wish you had changed or that you feel mm -hmm. like you missed? You know what's interesting? Um, all the years I was writing this book, if you guys ever hung out with me at all, and you guys did, if you saw me just sitting around having a like, coffee conversation, which is great that we get to capture mm. one of these things, I w we would have an idea, a bounce an idea off of, and Owen would say something and say, hey, that's, that's exactly right because this, and I'm taking notes on napkins. Mm. I have, I've been taking notes on napkins for years and years and years and years, and little pieces of paper and shredded paper and then I, and I worked it into my book too. And when I finished the book, I stopped taking notes. That was remarkable to me. Like something got out of my system. And, and on a, maybe on a little phrase or a turn of phrase or a little um, clarification, which is what we want to do here in this, in this mm. great conversation, a, a deepening or a clarification, but a, a new concept or a concept that hasn't it, there's not, I can't think of anything. And there's probably a lot. Yeah. But I just, my mind kind of shut down from the subject of men, women dynamic, that polarity, which is mm. the whole thing this is about. And it kind of just shut down, not, not stop being interested in it, but um, started looking for the next the next thing to explore, I guess. So does that mean you've outgrown your relentless pursuit to understand women? Oh, the feminine. <laughs> That's a great question. That's a great question. Mm, the rel relentless pursuit that I've had all these years to understand mm. women? Probably. But the feminine spirit and the masculine spirit and the combining of the two or, you know, that, that further journey? No. That's still very much... Because what, my next things, and, and what people have said to me, like the next thing we'd love to hear from you is like more of the, of that adventure. You left home and hearth and you took off mm -hmm. into the wild without any safety net. And that's kind of where I want to go with the next kind of project. I want to talk about what is that feeling of, you know, you know letting go of the shore, mm -hmm. binding yourself to the mast and putting yourself into the elements. And, and so that it is still relative to our relationship with women and polarity and stuff like that, but it's more of a, it becomes more of a, an inner quest, I guess, I guess you could say. I don't know. It's a good question. 
start the hero's journey almost yeah. Yeah. to get that courage yeah. to leave home sure what that moment's like yeah and you know and more and more I'm hearing people say we'd like to hear that story not personal story necessary but that that um, explore that kind of a concept like what is the what is the seeking of adventure no matter what the cost which is this is too but it's very strongly you know the journey of this man and his life of women so interesting <laughs> reminds me of so a lot of a lot of people come and spend time with you spend time with Amirati yeah. it reminds me of uh, a man who was here with us a couple of weeks ago in Bucharest and he was we called him dead man because he reminded me of Johnny Depp in that film you know where it starts off with yeah. order and it goes into chaos and yeah. you see this man at some point gets pushed around and takes a leap into the wildness and the unknown and he was sat on that question of do I stay in my modern, rational, clear, structured life back mm. home or do I take off into the elements? And it's like yeah. so many of us that, that gather around <coughs> to talk about your book, about the themes, about the Asa Murata on that mm. moment or on that precipice of yeah. do I really do it? Do I actually follow my authentic truth in my heart and take a dive yeah. into well, chaos? I, that's exactly what it is. I mean, I, Jordan, I've been saying for years, I, I've had this notion for years that all the best stories... All the best books, all the best films, to me anyway, involve journey. Mm. And it's not a journey to, you know, the promised land. It's a journey from order to chaos, like you said. Like Apocalypse Now, uh, Sheltering Sky, mm. Dead Man, Johnny Depp. Mm. It's all, everything's all buttoned up and normal. And then there's a journey into, like, just chaos. Mm. And this very much is the same thing to me. Is like at the beginning of the book, he says strong things, yeah. confidence, and he's, he's, he, he knows the answers that he's been interviewed before. He knows yeah. what, you know, I'll tell you what I know about women. I know this and this and this and this, and I also know this, right? And as he goes in his journey, and as the train continues to go, and she asks deeper questions of him, his order become, goes to chaos, and it becomes, it goes to mystery. The whole book flows outward to mystery. Mm. And it is a very, this feels like maybe when people are reading it, they don't, they don't feel that necessarily, and except maybe a train. But to me, this is a complete journey. The book is a journey from order to chaos, from knowledge to mystery, from, from absolute uh, confident uh, things that we know and, and the curiosity of the unknown and what, what's possible, potential. It's going to a horizon that you don't know. And, and to me, like, I could... I, I can never write another book that doesn't have that same kind of feel either. It has to be like that. I, f I think. It's funny. That's, and are we, oh, sorry, George. That's, that's, yeah. that's the way the tango was described to me as well. You know? Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's a dance into the unknown. Yeah. No, that's perfect. Mm. That's great. Because that's, that's where the, you know, I've always said, you know, you know, we shouldn't be seeking answers. We should be seeking the greater mystery. Yeah. <clears throat> Small mindset and answers. Big mindset and questions, and so uh, to me, that's like, and this would this had to be a book of questions. If I wrote it five years ago or finished it five years ago, it'd be a good book of answers. Yeah, 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 that's good. But it had to be a, a, a book of let's put these answers aside. Let's mention them. Mm. Let's put them aside because what else? Where can we possibly go? That's the idea. Makes me think of interacting with women as well, like. I experienced that there's something much more um, seductive, romantic about a man who's sat in these questions rather than mm. is a walk-in answer to yeah. everything. Yeah, because there's, and, and, and we'll touch on that when we get into the, the book more, but that's, you know, that's the essence of what true seduction is, which I didn't know for years. You think mm. seduction is like saying things a certain way or doing things a certain way. But seduction is to have the, the great confidence of knowing that you are a student of life. You don't have all the answers, but, but you're okay with that. And you're okay with the vulnerability and the mystery of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what's, what is seductive to women. We call authenticity. Your authenticity mm -hmm. is your good and, all your, and your bad all together and fully embraced. We try and hide our bad points, and hide, yeah. but fully embraced and say, this is who I am and I'm learning. And I can forgive myself everything because I am, I'm, at least the student I'm trying to learn. Yeah. Right? So. So before we go into the bigger questions, mm. 
do you want to say something about the cover? Ah, Because yeah. I, I get, it's called The Alabaster Girl. Yes. It's a beautiful girl, yes. adorned in white, smelling flowers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the rest of the cover's kind of grey and stormy. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's has some darkness to it. It's interesting because I, this cover came together about six weeks before publication. Maybe two months. Um, and and uh, my girlfriend, Deanna, and I were look, trying to, for a couple of years, we were discussing concepts and maybe, I didn't want to have it so obvious that there's a woman on the cover. Mm. You know, like a woman, like a romance novel or anything. Yeah. Or, or the shape of a woman, or too a obvious. Chick, yeah. Or, you know, or a flame that's in the shape of a woman. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Off a candle. Sure. Yeah. I didn't want to have it so obvious. And I said, I can't have a woman on the cover. It has to be some kind of abstract thing. So we toyed with the ideas of like a kind of a blue ribbon, just kind of like floating in, in, on a black background, you know, uh, so it doesn't really inform. But then at a, uh, a great designer in Romania, uh, Andre Kretchen, who did a fantastic job, he came with, he came, so I'll come up with some different concepts. This is the number one concept, concept, and he had four other ones, which are brilliant too. And this, this is a photograph that's obviously been adjusted by a Ukrainian young guy, he's about 20 years old, and this is a model he uses in his mm. photos. Mm. And he created this photograph with this uh, background. And so we contacted uh, Igor Lapko, who is the, the photographer, who is brilliant. He's a, he's a brilliant photo- photographic artist. Got the rights to this picture. Uh, my designer here in Romania designed the cover, and I didn't change a single thing because it was so landing and perfect. Mm. And the symbolism is all over the place. Yeah. Mm. And, and we could speak about it and say, well, this bird represents, you know what I mean? And, yes. and, uh, the, but it really is, to me, it's a feel. The, the, you look at that and you get the same feel as when it, when it is what I wanted to capture in the conversation, in the book itself. So it, it really aligned and it really matched up. And it was only like two months or a month before. And I'm, and, and I kind of like, makes me shiver a little bit to think what if I didn't get this and I had to like slap something together yeah you know what I mean it just came together thank you Andre <laughs> yeah and Igor great 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 designers who have a better eye than me so, <clears throat> so I remember you playing around with paint for windows oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> shapes and fonts around <laughs> <laughs> one one other quick thing I don't know if you want to talk about this now but Alabaster like yeah. why alabaster and mm. what is an alabaster girl? Is is that yeah, something for you? Yeah. yeah, because it is a question that arises because alabaster is a soft, malleable stone that mm. um, you know the the it's like the the woman with the alabaster box in the Bible, who is Mary Magdalene, who like you know had oil in the alabaster box mm. and she washed the feet of Jesus or, or anointed the feet of Jesus with the oil, the woman with the alabaster box. And that phrase had always been with me. And for some reason, I was sitting one time working on the book and trying to get this concept of this because it isn't this. Because alabaster, the stone alabaster, can range anywhere from white to, you know, to blue to a, kind mm. of a, a, a dark charcoal color. Uh, but it's predominantly known as being a white color. So I did have some questions. Does this mean a, a white girl? No. Mm. Uh, does it mean, uh, what does it mean? And it means a, a woman that is firm, has a, has a beautiful core, but is soft. It still has a softness around it. Mm. You know what I mean? Like the, the alabaster stone has, is translucent. If you, if, if, if they make lampshades out of it because a light shines through it. You know, you can make a glass out of, out of alabaster. And the Romans did that. You know, it's a, it's a very old stone. It's not as hard as marble, but it's translucent and it, and, it, and it lets light through. And it's the same thing. So it's the alabaster girl, which also, you know, which was, was a phrase that I, years and years and years ago, I came, came up with, matched that kind of concept of the, of the spirit of the female ideal, I guess you could say. Mm. That's the sense I get from it. It's like the perfect image in a man's mind of that ideal woman 
that he yearns to yeah. Yeah. experience, but just remains like slightly yeah. out of grasp. Yeah. And he might not know it. If you ask an average guy, listen, what's your ideal girl? He's got breasts like this and ass like this. And, and she looks good on my arm. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm getting rich and buying a yacht so I can have that on my arm. That's my ideal girl. I want a mm. girl looks good in bikini, right? Um, but I'm convinced that underneath of it all, most guys are seeking something different. They want a different, ex- a different conversation with women. They, they want a girl that looks good in a bikini on their arm. Yeah, they want that. But they also want to have some, a, a woman that makes them, like, the good word was yearn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yearn for like inspiration. Yearn for, for um, his personal truth and, and really feel... Um, really feel um, supported, I guess you could say, or no, inspired. Looking for the woman that inspires his muse and makes mm-hmm. him think, wow, you know what? There are all these troubles of the world, but I got that. That's where we're... So this is what it, the Alabaster Girl means. Yeah. So, and it is a poem. It arose from a poem. Maybe I should just quickly touch on that because it's going to be a question to the book. The poem is later in the book, but yeah. I'll say it now. I wrote this poem a long time ago, and it was this. Um, Man has only ever searched for three things in this world. The source of light, the perfect note, and alabaster girl. That's the poem I wrote. Mm -hmm. And what it means to me, very quickly, is mankind, us, the world, has always been trying to find three things in my mind. The source of light, which is, why are we here? Does God exist? Who created us? The Big Bang? What is, what is, where is the point of origin? Mm. In other words, where does the light come from? Why is there something instead of nothing? The source of light. And now that we all, atheists, uh, creationists, uh, you, you name it, <clears throat> recognize that we are in fact here, <clears throat> the source of light, so the next thing is, what is the perfect note? Perfect musical note. What is the perfect balance of life to live a life of meaning and value? So the perfect note of, of the best rhythm to live a life that has makes you full of joy and 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 and, and you know helps the poor or whatever. What is the best way to live that life? And the alabaster girl is our is our is our other half our polarity that we need. So that's where the title came from. That's 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 where the book came from. I imagine that those two other questions are um, about the light and the note mm. are the kind that came up in Nicaragua. Before that. Wow. This poem was written over 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it's, to me it's like, a, it's a simple poem, but it's like, it represents, I guess, the kind of things that I'm trying to understand for myself, so it makes sense. We got all deep at the very beginning here. Yeah. Right oh, <laughs> Okay. Job done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an episode. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. That's good. Beautiful. Yeah. I want to I find would, out more. I would, I would like to know one more question. About, I would have one more question on the renunciation. Mm. You had one renunciation before Nicaragua, yes? Yes. And yeah. You had a second one. Well, I had one real renunciation where I started my life. We'll talk about it later, but mm. where I went through this youthful journey and then a career journey of trying to like keep up with the Joneses and be this, you know, follow the societal recommended path. And I and I removed myself from that. I, I, I renounced it at some point, which informs my next ten years, the ten years of the book. Right around the same time I started writing this book. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But the second one in Nicaragua, was there a second one in Nicaragua or not? No, it just made me realize that's the message. I see. Mm-hmm. I had one great renunciation in my life. That was to like walk away from society, mm-hmm. you know, hit the road, carry on bag, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and try and, you know, try and seek something. And then Nicaragua shaped the message into a really strong, strong message. Okay. So, yeah. And you say in the book, one of my favorite phrases, your greatest fear in life is mediocrity. And this book seems symbolic of 
mediocre relationships mm. men have with women. Uh, you, you don't just talk about these things, you live these things in, in life and with yeah. women. It's a fight against mediocrity to something more authentic and real. Yeah, I really do think that's, that's the ultimate battle. It's not a, a battle against evil, it's a battle against mediocrity. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not good and evil, it's good and mediocrity. And I said in the book here, mediocrity is catching. Yeah. You ca- look away from it. You know, you, 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 yeah, you look at all the reality TV shows and all mm-hmm. this, and it's so, so, so surface and shallow, and it's catching. It's like the whole world is like caught up in this. Yeah, but that's, a, that's for another episode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's great. Should we dive right in? Let's cut. Because I want to see how the test is. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's going to be the most awkward one. Yeah. (laughs)